the Aryan age from 1500 to 1000 BC around 2000 BC the original Indo-European speaking semi-nomadic barbarians who most probably lived in the region between the Caspian and the Black Sea were driven from their homeland by some natural disaster possibly drought, prolonged frost or plague. Whatever the cause of their dispersion, it may even have been a series of Mongol invasions from Central Asia, the ancestors of the Italic Greek, Germanic, English, Celtic, Iranian, Sanskritic and modern Hindi-speaking peoples were forced to flee from Southern Russia to survive. Possibly draw okay, whatever the These tribes moved in every direction, splitting up into smaller, more cohesive units, driving their herds of cattle, sheep, goats and domestic horses with them. And opening a new chapter in the history of Europe as well as of India. The Hittites were the first Indo-Europeans to settle in a new homeland, for we find traces of them just south of Caucasia in Cappadocia that date from approximately 2000 BC. Other tribes pushed on. However, Hmm. However, some to the west across Anatolia and some to the east across Persia, now named Iran, are cognitive Aryan for the Indo-Iranian language, brought by Indo-Europeans to the region between 1800 and 1500 BC. The Indo-Iranians seem to have lived for some time in harmony following their long migration. By almost 1500 BC, however, they appear to have split once more, and pastoral tribes known to history as the Indo-Iranians, or simply Aryans, advanced still further east, across the perilous Hindu Kush mountains into India. Our knowledge of the earliest history of our linguistic ancestors is derived from over a century of patient reconstruction of their irham by philosophers such as Frederick Marx, who developed the science of linguistic paleontology by analyzing all the languages within this great linguistic family and extracting the geographic, climatic, botanical and zoological terms that all have in common. It has been possible to chart an ecological map of the original homeland which most closely resembles Caucasia, the ingenious inside that sparked this magnificent labor of comparative linguistic philology was published most effectively by Sir William Jones, a judge of the British East India's company High Court. Sir William studied Sanskrit after his arrival to Calcutta in 1783, and three years later he wrote an illuminating and learned paper that noted the vocabulary and other linguistic bonds that make the Greek, Latin, Germanic and Sanskrit tongues or relatives within one single Indo-European family of languages. <coughs> we have no archaeological evidence for the first centuries of India's Aryan age from about 1500 to 1000 BC. But we have been able to piece together some pictures of the era from the Aryans' religious book of knowledge or Vedas. Which were so sedulously preserved by the bards of each tribe through rigorous oral tradition. The oldest and most important of these sacred works, the Rig Veda, literally verses of knowledge, 
consist of 1017 Sanskrit poems, most of which are addressed to various Aryan gods and solicit their bounty. It is the world's earliest surviving Indo-European literature. <coughs> Unlike the pre-Aryan peoples of Harappa, the Aryans lived in tribal villages with their migrant herds. Their houses, fashioned of bamboo or light wood, have not survived the ravages of time. They baked no bricks, built no elaborate baths or sewer systems, created no magnificent statues or even modest figurines. They had no seals or writing, no fashion art, no splendid homes. Were these relatively primitive tribal peoples, in fact, capable of storming and conquering fortified Indus cities, perhaps? They had harnessed their horses to chariots and they seemed to have wielded hafted bronze axes, a few of which were found in the highest threat of Indus cities, as well as long bows and arrows. They had been toughened by their trek, had endured blistering sun and crossed high passes de del deluged with sleet and snow. The Rig Veda itself, however, is unconscious of that journey and of the Aryan invasion of India, yet it does mention Aryan victories against fortified places, within which dark-skinned people had sought in vain to defend themselves against the fairer-skinned, wheat-colored Aryans. Since the Rig Veda was not written down before about 600 BC, and the earliest surviving text dates back only as far as about 1200 AD. We may ask first of all how we know that the Vedic hymns were actually composed as early as 1500 BC, when it is generally assumed the Aryans first invaded India. Before 1909, the only way the age of the Vedas could be approximated was by Max Miller's dead rack roaming backwards technique. Muller analyzed the entire corpus of Vedic literature linguistically as well as ideologically, noting the various changes in Sanskrit case endings and word forms, as well as syntax, vocabulary, and meaning. He determined how long it had taken to effect comparable changes in ancient Greek and Latin and framed a similar timetable for the evolution of Sanskrit. There are three major stages in the evolution of those sacred Vedic texts that are still considered revealed literature or Shruti literally heard by Hindus. The initial stage includes the Rig Veda and three other ancient collections, Smathits, Samhitas or hymns and magical incantations or spells, the Sama, Yajur, and Atharva Vedas, all of which are archaic poetic texts. Next emerged a series of prose commentaries on each of the Vedas, elaborating upon those often cryptic hymns and describing in minute detail the procedures required for preparing the Vedic sacrifices and properly propitiating the gods. Because they exalt the significance and role of the Aryan priestly class, the Brahmans, from the word sacred utterance, or those who chant sacred utterances, the commentaries are called the Brahmanas. Finally, a third group of mystical philosophic works appear, whose predominant form, the poetic dialogue, and whose radical new religious messages sharply differentiate them from the Brahmanas and Samhitas alike. These are the Vedanta Upanishads, many of whose ideas are similar to those in early Buddhism. Muller reasoned that they must have been composed at about the time the Buddha lived, 
or somewhere during the 6th century BC. Then by that reckoning backwards, he estimated that within the 108 surviving Upanishads texts, there had been significant ideological, if not linguistic, evolution, which probably took several centuries that would move the date of their composition back to about the 8th century, from whence it would have taken at least two centuries for the Brahmanis to have been written. <coughs> if the last of the Vedic Samathas was then completed and ready for commentary by 1000 BC, it seems safe to infer that the oldest sections of the Rig Veda must have been at least four centuries older and hence the estimated date of around 1400 BC for the compilation of the Vrig. In 1909, excavations of the Hittite site of Bogaskoy in Cappadocia yielded tablets containing a treaty concluded between the Hittite king and his Mitanni neighbor to the east, King Mativaza, who reigned in about 1400 BC. Invoked as divine witnesses to this treaty were four gods, Indira, Yuruvna, Mithira, and the Nasatiya, whose Sanskrit names in the Rig Veda were spelled virtually the same, proving that by this date the Vedic pantheon had acquired its identity. This confirmation of Muller's estimates leads us to assume that since the Rig Veda itself does not mention the Aryan invasions of India, the process must have begun at least a century earlier. Or probably around 1500 BC. The final wave of tribal invasions may have come centuries after the first Aryan started over the northwest passes. <coughs> this was the most important invasion in all of India's history. Since the Aryans brought with their Caucasian genes, this was the most important invasion in all of India's history. Since the Aryans brought with their Caucasian genes a new language, Sanskrit, and a new pantheon of gods, as well as the patriarchal, patrilineal family and the three class social structure, priests, warriors, and commoners, into which their tribes were organized. Limited as we are by Vedic sources, we naturally know more about ancient Aryan religion than other aspects of the culture. <coughs> Before considering Rig Vedic religious beliefs and practices, however, let us see what can be gleaned from that work about Aryan social organization and other mundane matters. The term Aryan, while Primarily a linguistic family designation had also the secondary meaning of high born or noble. The Aryan commoners or wish the word later used to designate the largest class in Aryan society Vashyash were most broadly divided into tribes or Janna, though united by language and religion. as well as in warfare against their common non-Aryan dark enemies, the Dasas. These tribes appear generally to have been at war with one another. The foremost Aryan tribe was called Bharata, probably with the name of its first Raja or King. It is honored to this day by the Republic of India, which adopted Bharat as its official Sanskrit name with the inauguration of its constitution in 1915. The later Aryan epic Mahabharata is the tale of many Raja cousins and their interminable battles. 
Each Aryan tribe had its bards who were priests and they alone memorized the Vedic hymns and officiated over the sacrifices. The Raja, his Brahmans and with settled in villages, Grama, keeping their herds of valuable cattle, horses, sheep and goats in nearby pasture. Cows were so highly valued by Aryans that they came to be treated as currency and were paid to Brahmans for performing religious services. The Vedic Aryan were, however, beef eaters. and wine drinkers as well as warriors. It is not clear exactly when the Indians began to consider the cow divine. It must have been a later development or perhaps a pre-Aryan concept resurrected in transmuted form. Since we can assume that the pre-Aryans worshipped the bull, Indians may thus have been the earliest people, though they would not remain the only ones to worship their money. Just as each Aryan tribe was ruled by an autocratic male Raja, each family was controlled by its father, whose dominant role over his wife and children was to become the standard pattern for subsequent Indian familial relationships in which male supremacy and hierarchy dictated by age were to remain the rule. The joint or extended family where the wives of all sons comes to live and raise their children within the patriarchal household seems to have developed early in the Aryan age. One of the most common prayers in the Vedas is for manly heroic Virasans who were not only needed to help care for the herds but who would also bring honor to their fathers and tribes in battle and be able to perform the sacrifice to aid the souls of their fathers attain peace after death. The word Veera in the Rig Veda was in fact hardly distinguishable from Sun, since all young men were expected to be heroic fighters. Daughters, however, were little valued. Dowries would be required for them, and although the status of women in Aryan society was probably higher than it was to remain throughout most of Indian history, they were forbidden to participate in any sacrifice to the gods since their presence was considered a source of pollution. Sons alone could inherit property, which was usually divided equally among them after the father's death. Primogeniture was reserved for royal families unless the firstborn was blind or otherwise seriously handicapped. We find no evidence of polygamy or child marriage in the Vedas, though both were subsequently practiced in most parts of India, which may again reflect the re-emergence of pre-Aryan customs. The country inhabited by the Aryans during the period in which the Rig Veda was composed was known as the land of the seven rivers. It consisted primarily of the Punjab whose five great rivers, the Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Bia, Satlej flow into the Indus which may then have captured the seventh river called Saraswati. Now only a minor stream in the Rajasthan desert. The river Ganga was barely known to be to the Aryans by the end of the Rig Veda era, indicating that the conquering tribes expanded quite slowly toward the east, taking about five centuries to move from the Khyber to beyond the region of Delhi. Throughout the interview, the process of Aryan and pre-Aryan conflict 
cooperation and assimilation must have affected major changes in the character of Aryan society and thought. as well as in the nature of the indigenous civilization. The simple tribal structure grew more complex during this period as warfare and conquest brought new peoples and problems under the ruling Rajas, who required the assistance of noble warriors and the advice of councils of household elders to govern their burgeoning tribes. We know little more about these earliest political institutions of India than their Sanskrit names, but from what is known of tribal rule elsewhere, especially among other Indo-Europeans, it seems fair to assume that each king picked the heartiest soldiers to serve in his entourage and sought the advice of those patriarchs in his tribes who were most shrewd or powerful. <coughs> Surely the Rishis sages who are named in the Rig Veda were among those first approached by Rajas for assistance in practical as well as spiritual matters. The distinct separation between ma ma martial, royal and priestly classes found among the Aryan appears to have diminished over time. If indeed priest kings had ruled pre-Aryan Harappa, It may be that Aryan Rajas learned from their slaves to rely more heavily upon the counsel of their own Brahmans. At any rate, the hymn of the sacrifice of the cosmic man, which appears in the tenth and final book of the Rig Veda, explains that the four great classes of Aryan society emerged from different parts of the original cosmic man's anatomy. The Brahmans issuing forth first from the mouth, the Kshatriyas second from the arms, the Vaishas third from the thighs, and the Shuddhas last from the feet. This revelation according to which all Rajas who were Khashtiyas by birth, fell below all Brahmins. Who alone were associated with the cosmic head, may well have roused ancient royal wrath, though not enough to lead the sacred hem or alter a word of it. Gold the metal most frequently mentioned in the Rig Veda must have been panned from the rivers of the northwest and used in ritual sacrifices as well as for jewelry. The next most common metal was Ayaz, which appears initially to have manned bronze rather than iron. Since later in the Athar Veda, we find the distinction made between red Ayaz and dark Ayaz, the former most likely referring to bronze and the later to iron. Some of the passages in the Athar Veda are known to have been added a few centuries after the Rig Veda had been finished, and it is most probable that iron was not discovered in India until the Aryans had moved as far east as the modern state of Bihar. Where rich deposits of ore continue to be mined to this day. which could not have been before 1000 BC. By that time, the use of iron had spread to Iran from its center of discovery by the Hittites in the west. It may have entered India with fresh waves of invading Iranians 
since its use was initially associated with pins and other parts of how horse harnesses as well as weapons Another thesis of the ancient city of Hastinapur the epic capital of a great Aryan tribe Shards of painted grey ware date to its lowest level to about 1000 BC while from later levels for iron weapons and tools have been unearthed the oldest found as yet in India By the time the Rig Veda was written the Aryans had apparently made the transition from a nomadic pastoral economy to a combined agriculture and pastoral one for they reap some variety of grain which must have been barley or wheat there is no reference to rice however until the atharveda the lion was known in rig vedic times as was the elephant whose sanskrit name means beast with a hand but neither the rhinoceros nor the tiger both so prominent on indus valley seals is mentioned the horse was second only to the cow in importance and chariot racing was one of the aryans leading sports the vedic aryans appeared to have loved music wine and gambling as well as war and chariot racing all their hymns were chanted but the sama veda was specially designed for song and there were lutes flutes and drums which the gods and goddesses were said to have played from this era at least indians continued to use song and dance as an integral part of their religious worship and no sacred hindu ceremony today including the funeral procession would be complete without its musicians no temple without its dancers indian devotion to song and dance however predated the aryan invasion for the dancing girl of mohenjodaro survives to speak mutely to you to us of an art that is surely as old as indian civilization itself Another statue found at Harappa though possibly of later vintage than that civilization is a grey stone miniature torso of a dancer whose distinctive three-way twist of shoulders and hips reminds us of Shiva in his most magnificent pose as king of the dance Nataraja As for drink was daily in bibed by the vedic warrior god indra to help him overcome the terrible demon with whom he did battle and we must assume that aryan tribesmen also indulged in such libation it is not quite clear whether this heavenly drink was alcoholic psychedelic or narcotic though we assume that it was made from a plant that grows wild in the foothills of the himalayas which may have been hashish or peyote The effects of this drink were so remarkably powerful that Sama was de- deified and the Sama sacrifice became the foremost religious event of the Aryan year. Since the game of dice like chess was invested in was invented in India and many dice carved of nuts were found at Mohenjo-daro It is hardly surprising to note that the Aryans were avid gamblers. Cast on the board like magic bits of charcoal, the coal themselves they burn the heart to ashes. Lamented the Rig Veda gambler in one of the rare secular hymns of that sacred collection. The abandoned wife of the gambler mounts in debt fear and need of money he wanders by night to the homes of the others gambling continued to preoccupy aryan indians throughout the epic era as well 
एंड इन दी महाभारत वी फाइंड द फाइव वर्चुअस एंड नोबल पांडव ब्रदर्स नोबल पांडव ब्रदर्स लूजिंग देयर वेरी किंगडम एंड देयर सिंगल बिलव वाइफ द मोस्ट फेमस केस ऑफ पॉलियंद्री एंड संस्कृत लिटरेचर टू द ट्रेशरसली सेडक्टिव रोल ऑफ द डाइस अदर सेक्युलर हिम्स गिव अस इनसाइट इनटू द डेली ऑक्युपेशंस एंड एस्पिरेशंस ऑफ रिक वैदिक इंडियंस देयर वर कारपेंटर्स एंड व्हील राइड्स ब्लैक स्मिथ्स एंड टेनर्स वीवर्स एंड स्पिनर्स एज वेल एज फार्मर्स एंड हर्डर्स अमंग द ट्राइब्समैन हु सेटल डाउन टू द रूटीन ऑफ विलेज इंटरडिपेंडेंस एज दे एक्सपेंडेड टूअर्ड दिल्ली एंड द गैंगेटिक प्लेन द श्रुद्धास who did the mental level may originally have been pre aryan dasas reduced to serfdom or slavery by captivity and easily kept and lowly status because of darker skin color the sanskrit word that came to mean class varna and that is still used with the modifiers brahman kshatriya vaishya and shudra to identify the four broadest categories of hindu caste society originally meant covering associated with skin covering and its varying colors each varna had its distinguishing color white for brahmans red for kshatriyas known for vaishyas and black for shudras acute color consciousness thus developed early during india's aryan age and has since remained a significant factor in reinforcing the higher caste social attitudes that are so deeply embedded in indian civilization there is no reference to untouchables in the rigveda but fears of pollution became so pervasive in indian society that it is difficult to believe that they were not in fact pre aryan in origin in all probability the sub class of untouchables emerged late in the aryan age recruited first perhaps from those shrudhas or dasas who performed tasks that were considered unclean such as the work of tanners associated with animal carcasses and that of sweepers especially among the ashes of cremation grounds while all shrudhas were therefore held to be fully a life below the three higher twice born classes whose sacred thread ceremony of rebirth mark their attainment of manhood and access to vedic lore some were considered so much less worthy than others that they were cast beyond the pale of recognized society the religion of the early aryans centered around the worship of a pantheon of nature gods to whom sacrificial offerings were periodically made for the good things of life and for repose thereafter no one deity ruled over the pantheon which included some 33 divinities named in the rigveda but the most powerful gods to whom many hymns were addressed were indra varuna agni and soma indra was the war god youthful heroic ever victorious like thor he wields thunderbolts and hovers in atmospheric realms assisted by an obscure storm god named rudra who comes to be identified only much later as the rig vedic form of shiva <laughs> the association of indra with the power to release waters as well as wind wars helps explain his special significance for he is hailed as surpassing floods and rivers in his greatness perhaps he was the first great leader of the aryan conquest a historic figure whose youthful force overcame all obstacles standing so tall and strong he seemed to hold fathor sky upon his shoulders separating it from mother earth as one simplistic myth of vedic creation insisted he required much nourishment and drank his soma greedily in three gulps every morning before going forth to defeat the demon vitra whose limbless body enclosed all creation including the sun waters and cows holding life in a state of inert suspension and darkness with his mighty and fatal weapon the thunderbolt indra pierced the dark demon's covering and released the dawn 
which is why hindu prayers to indra are chanted so early every morning to help him defeat the night <coughs> leaving the demon prostrate while the waters like billowing cows rushed low loving toward the ocean indra then became the lord of what moves and what remains rested vritra was the symbol of pre aryan power warder of the dasa lord hence the hymn that tells of the battle between indra and vritra may be viewed as of historic as well as cosmogonic significance conveying the essence of the aryan victory It has indeed been suggested that Vitra was no demon at all but a dam constructed across the Indus by pre-Aryan to control the river for irrigation agriculture and that by destroying that barrier or cover the Aryans flooded the region and its great cities facilitating their conquest Once Indra's victory was achieved however Varuna the king of universal order later dharma stepped forward to take the central position of aryan religious authority presiding over the sun filled sky varuna was the divine lord of justice who has spread out the earth as the butcher does the hide by way of a carpet for the sun extended the air above the trees put strength in horses milk in cows will power in hearts fire in waters the sun in the heaven and soma upon the mountain <coughs> varuna was the divine judge of aryan india and appeals for mercy would be chanted to him by those who strayed from the path of virtue older and wiser than indra varuna was most honored by the aryans the elder statesman on high closely connected with the sun god surya and with one of his lesser manifestations in the rig veda vishnu who later shared with shiva virtual monotheistic dominance over hinduism agni was god of fire and as such had many forms traversing the three realms of earth atmosphere and heavens he was needed for every sacrifice he mirrored the sun and he had the power to heal fathomable in creating self incubating heat tapas with the origin of creation the rig veda sounds so surprisingly scientific that we may find it difficult to reconcile such later their sophistication with much of the rig veda's earliest navite The word tapas however was subsequently used in relation to yogic contemplation and its use in the Rig Veda may reflect the reemergence of India's oldest form of religion as well as science the self-imposed rigor of isolated meditation that gave birth to so many illuminating insights throughout Indian history desire which later came to mean love was the source of that one stirring to life the force behind creation moving even a neuter spirit to sow the first seed of mind as it was so often to move india's noblest sages and gods from the austere depths of their contemplation to peaks of passionate bliss had pre aryan yogis such as the one depicted on the seal from mohenjodaro learn by now the language of their conquerors teaching their own secrets in turn to brahman bards was india's beat an ancient wisdom starting already to take its toll of youthful aryan energy and optimistic self assurance <clears throat> North Indian conquest and unification from 1000 to 450 BC The Aryan conquest of North India was thus a process of gradual institutional assimilation and socio-cultural integration between 
invading barbaric hordes and their more civilized pre-Aryan slaves. It would take more than a thousand years for that process of historic change to reach its peak of political unification under Mauryan rule in 326 BC, by which time the center of North Indian power and civilized achievement had shifted more than a thousand miles east of the Indus to the region of modern Patna, then called Patnaliputra in the Gangetic Plain. Our sources for reconstructing that slow and complex process of historic evolution are both literally and archaeological. Yet for many centuries in most parts of India, the record rem 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 remains as blank as most Indian cave walls. And even when excitingly beautiful historic frescoes are found, they emerge only as fragments. The Mahabharata whose epic core probably reflects Indian life at about 1000 BC, starts with King Santanu's intoxicated love for the beautiful goddess Ganga, whom he marries, symbolizing the Aryan advance east of the Doab into the Gangetic Plain. It was no simple romance or conquest, however, requiring heavy plows and other sturdy tools to clear the primitive forest of that lush region that even sophisticated Harappan technology had not been able to master. Recent discoveries of painted greyware at Hastinapura, Alamgirpur and Kosambi UP indicate that by about 1000 BC, the Aryans had mastered the metallurgy of iron which they may have learned from their Indo-European cousins. Who ruled the neighboring save, defend or destroy? Hailed as offspring of the primeval waters, he also called illuminator of darkness, and as the many tongue deity of the sacred altar he presided over ritual functions. Soma was the god of immortality, the nectar whose glorious drops impart freedom and protects one's body from disease. May we enjoy with an enlivened spirit the Jews thou gravest like ancestral riches shunted the Aryans to divine Soma. O Soma, King, prolong thou our existence, favor us and make us prosper. For thou hast settled in each joint, O Soma. Among the lesser personified powers of nature worshipped by the Vedic Aryans, the loveliest was Yusash, the dawn, rosy fingered daughter of the sky. For her most beautiful poems were chanted. She brought all of her lights the fairest. The seeming simplicity of the Aryan nature worshipping religion was soon obscured by the Vedic conquest of an understanding of cosmic origins and control over cosmic forces. The immediate purpose of a sacrifice was to secure some divine favor, whether fortune, longevity, or progeny, but it also had cosmic meaning in that its proper performance helped maintain the balance of order in the universe. The Aryan householder gave his god Soma, ghee, clarified butter, and other del delicacies not simply in return for their favors, but because it was his duty to propitiate them so, just as they in turn were obliged to act in the appropriate fashion toward him. For gods as well as men had their individual deities, which were part of the cosmic scheme of things, and only when all behaved properly would the universe function as it was designed to do? The true order. Demons of falsehood were always trying to destroy that perfect balance, starting floods, bringing drought or famine, appearing in the guise of tigers or mad elephants. They were ever present as mosquitoes and other evil creatures that burst, crawled or walked upon the earth. 
the balance was tenuous at all times, which was why so many sacrifices were required and why Brahmins had to be employed day and night to chant the hymns they memorized. Truth, Rita, could always be subverted by falsehood, Antrita. Just as the real Sat or existent world might always be disguised by imagined or unreal, Asat. illusions, fantasies, and non-existent fears and terrors. The word Sat, which originally means existent, came thus to be equated with cosmic reality and its underlying ethical principle, truth. To Vedic man, the universe was divided between Earth's fair surface and the heavenly dome above it. The realm in which Sat prevailed and the demon darkness beneath this world, where unreality and falsehood dominated all. Indra's daily battle renewed the wonder of creation, but speculation about this mighty hero soon led to profound questions. Who ever saw him? Who is he that we should praise him? Before the Rig Veda was finished, such speculation was responsible for the creation of a number of super deities, whose all embracing qualities and impersonal characteristics more nearly resembled monotheistic than pantheistic gods. Prajapati, whose name means Lord of Creatures, emerged as a more comprehensive god than Indra as did Vishwakarman, the maker of all, and Brahmanaspati, lord of the sacred utterance, Brahman. The introduction of the last name clearly connotes the growing power and presumption of the Brahman priest, who further exalted their ritual chantings by deifying speech itself as the goddess Vak. The evolution of a monistic principle of creation, however, came only at the very end of Rig Veda, when we find a neuter pronoun and numeral, Tak Ikkam, that one, cited as the source of all creation, anticipating differentiation of any sort and all deities, self-existent, self-generating, unique. There was not then either the non-existent or the existence. There was no sky nor heavenly world beyond it. What covered all where? What was its protection? Was there a fathomless depth of the waters? Begins this most remarkable and precocious of all Vedic hymns. It continues. There was neither death nor immortality then. There was the sheen neither of day nor of night. That one, Tak Ekam, breath, came to life. Though uninspired by breath, by its own potentiality, besides its nothing existed. There was darkness hidden by darkness at the beginning. This all was an unilluminated flood. The first, which was hidden by a shell, that one was born through the power of its own. By about 1000 BC, then India's Aryans were asking questions and positing hypothetical solutions to problems that still remained on Iranian plateau. Although they were armed with force enough to overcome the natural barriers to their eastward advance and equipped with weapon to subdue resistance from their Dasa precursors, the Aryans could never seem to resolve their own inter-tribal conflicts. The Mahabharata, much like the Iliad, he is drenched in the blood of endless warfare. 
echoing the cries of royal cousins who are locked in mortal combat over their legacy to King Satano's domain. A residue of quite primitive or perhaps non-Aryan barbarism survives in the bloodlust of the noble warrior Bhima, who howls like a wolf and dances wildly about the battlefield of Kurukshetra after drinking the heart's blood of his slaughtered cousin, Dushansana. Aryan chivalry had by now reached the level of Arthurian legend. Religious virtue was all too humanly united. However, with hopeless addiction to gambling in the hero Dharmaraja, himself who loses at dice not only his fortune and kingdom but all that was owned by his noble Pandava brothers as well, and their lovely polyandrous wife. Draupadi. The epic struggle marks a transition at about this time from pastoral nomadism to the consolidation and confederation of Aryan tribes into royal territorious kingdom. With capitals like Hastinapura near Delhi, dominating the surrounding agriculture and forest domain. which came to be called Aryavarta, land of the Aryans. Several elaborate sacrifices designed to consecrate royalty appear in the Brahmana commentaries on the Vedas, composed from about 1000 to 700 BC, further attesting to the growing significance of kingship. In the battle between gods and demons, we are told the gods were losing until they decided to make a king. <coughs> Choosing Indra, who then swiftly led them to victory. The royal consecration sacrifice therefore refers to the Raja as a partner of the gods, inheriting some of the powers of Indra. Other sacrifices were performed to rejuvenate aging monarchs who drank the revitalizing Sama and raced in chariot meets, which they were invariably permitted to win. The horse sacrifice was performed to enhance a Raja's domain and further prove his profess. A great white stallion was turned loose and left to wander free for a year. For a year followed by a troop of royal horsemen who staked their king's claim to all the territory within boundaries surveyed by his stallion. At year's end, the horse was driven home, first to be ritually mated with the king's wife, then killed and carved into quarters, symbolizing his universality and that of his monarch. As king became more powerful, they were no longer content with the mere rank of Raja but assumed more pre pretentious titles such as Great King and Rural Over Or. Maharaja or Samraja. The earlier Rigveda tribal chieftains, little more than the first among many heads of families who met in regular council bore as much resemblance to such monarchs as bamboo villages did to cities like Hastinapura. <laughs> the Satapata Brahmana allegorically relates the eastward expansion of the Aryans as the spread of Agni's divine fire consuming forest as he advanced, pausing only at broad rivers, along long enough for his devotees to learn to marry him across without destroying themselves in his flames. Vidya Mathava was credited with having routed Agni across the river Gandak and natural border of what was then called Kosala.